Hey everybody, welcome back to the PC Perspective Podcast. We are at episode 673. This is being recorded on Wednesday, April 20, 2022. I'm Sebastian Peake. I'm Jeremy Hellstrom. I'm Josh Walrath. I'm Brett Van Spurenberg. Thanks for having me back. You can find out when we go live for events like this podcast recording session by visiting pcper.com slash subscribe and join our antiquated mailing list. Or, you know, just subscribe on YouTube and hit the bell so that you get notified when we go live, which is the sort of, I don't know, the modern way of doing that. Hmm. But, you know, whatever. If you want to be on the uh, famous PC per spam list, you can do that. You can support us on Patreon and have your name read aloud. Should we do the burger segment, Josh, or no? We're going to skip it. I'll just quickly talk about it. You know, I screwed okay. up. I screwed up. I didn't take a picture of the burger. I don't know why. I thought I did, but, you know, 49-year-old brain sometimes just doesn't hit on all cylinders. I, I put everything kind of together, and I grab my phone, and I think something happened at work, and I, I don't know. But anyway, it was it was the Badger Burger, and I don't know why they call it the Badger Burger. No it was mushrooms. a single beef patty. Topped with Havarti cheese, tater tots, mac and cheese sauce, and jalapenos. And it was tasty. It was. I, w- I wish you could see it. It was, it was kind of, you know, messy. They did put uh, lettuce, tomato, onions on it, which kind of took away from some of the subtle flavors of the mac and cheese, the the mac and cheese sauce, and the uh, the Havarti, but. You know, it was it was still very pleasant. It was a good experience. It, it filled me up. It filled me with joy. I was no longer hungry afterwards. And um, for a burger anymore, it wasn't that much. It was like 10 bucks plus tax and then tip. So you can't get a good burger anymore for anything less than seemingly 11 bucks. Except like at In-N-Out. They, they've kept prices somehow contained I, I don't know how but kudos to them but anyway yeah sorry for no picture it was it was a little messy it's a little fun now josh there was actually another meal in your twitter feed that i went and grabbed an image of and i just couldn't believe that something like that existed that was the what's the weird about it referring, the what is this shot it, it's literally a fried sloppy joe because that's what the sloppy joe is Oh, oh yeah, was, no, that's that's a grilled cheese sandwich with sloppy Joe meat. Yeah, so and sloppy Joe with cheese, cheese on bread. Yeah, it sounds bread positively nice delicious. Of course, I will. <laughs> yeah, that's a heart attack on a plate, but yes, it's yeah. one I'm willing to take for the team. Thank you. I mean, I don't think I'd eat yeah. both of them. I think one I think would one be would enough. Be enough. Yeah. Yeah. Our first news story this week. The excitement surrounding the Ryzen 7 5800X3D launch. It's like nothing we've ever seen. And the availability of this limited availability product is limited. Uh, currently out of stock at Newegg, out of stock, unavailable. It's actually what it says on Amazon.com. Though Newegg has added this little note, this product is temporarily out of stock because of high demand. We will replenish it as soon as possible. Though you can buy it from Cenitech. A third-party seller with seventy-four percent positive feedback for just five eighty-nine ninety-nine. Well, it wasn't, you know, okay. It was high demand, but it wasn't like exceptionally high demand because when they released it, it was still available four hours after release. When I checked, and then later this afternoon is when they all went out of stock. So people were buying, but not at the previously seen. I'm going to throw my bots at it and get a bunch of them all at once. Yeah, it's currently unavailable. I'm sure they sold hundreds of them, at least. At least. <laughs> I was reading Charlie on this, that semi accurate, and he was basically saying this is a product that you're going to sell for the price point of your previous product, the non 3D 5800X, but it costs you considerably more to make. So, how does this product make sense at this price point? It doesn't. My theory about this from the beginning was that it was there to take the gaming crown from Intel. They seeded it out to reviewers. And if you were fortunate enough to be selected, you had a review out on the 14th with these impressive gaming performance numbers. But if you actually benchmark this CPU across the board, it doesn't always beat the 5800X. 
which you know obviously has the same MSRP, but is currently selling for $100 less. So unless you're playing in very low resolution uh, situations for a $450 processor, then it doesn't really have the same edge, like as we talked about last week. If you're playing even at 1080p high, suddenly it's like maybe like 2% uh, better than the Intel offering, and then you go up to 1440, and it's just, it's, it's a wash at that point. So the one, the one thing that we, we don't really look a lot at is um, a lot of benchmarks looking at the you know, 1% low, 0.01% low. And this apparently is an area where you do see some improvement. So you're not going to get a lot of faster frame rates, but you are going to have more consistent play because you're not going to have as large a drops. Um, there are people who have seen, you know, 15 to 20% improvement in that, you know, low 1% uh, type range, which is pretty decent. And, uh, you know, if, if you're, enjoying micro stutter then you know don't get this cpu um another area is like uh people have seen some pretty good uh, improvements in like a set of corso competizoni because their physics engine runs at like 400 hertz and they have like tire wear chassis deformation tire deformation surface um weight shifting, all of these things thrown together to get the most, you know, accurate kind of driving experience. And they use uh, physics models from many of the major manufacturers that, you know, they've actually done testing on uh, for actual racing stuff. So in something like that, even at like, you know, 1440 medium, uh, they're seeing a tremendous increase in overall performance and uh, i guess in the 1.8 version they multi-threaded uh the physics engine so in corner cases like that it seems like it's you know it's really the best processor out there um but yeah it would be nice to do a little bit more uh uh frame rating Hold yeah, that. no, you're not Hold wrong. That. I think that you would actually see something with that uh, specific type of benchmark, where yeah, it's it's that 99th percentile is much much better, but overall, yeah, it's going to be hard to measure. Still, a lot cheaper than buying yourself a better GPU. So, better performance of 1440 medium <laughs> is not the worst ever. But how does this compare to the 12900K? 12900K is what, 530? 560? About 530, okay. yeah. The last time I looked. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, you're getting as good a performance for that much less, but you're going to be suffering in other applications where the higher hmm. clock speed and uh, more cores that they can throw at things uh, will kind of do better. It's certainly not faster single threaded. It's no. it's faster in certain circumstances when you can make use of more cores because it does have lower clocks than the 5800X non-3D. It's actually interesting. Uh, Charlie is semi-accurate. Um, I pulled up his review here because I was trying to remember this. He says the L3 cache on the X3D is four cycles slower than the L3 cache on the non-3D 5800X. Yeah, that makes so, sense. And mm. it's he calls it a server part that's being repurposed uh, as a consumer part, that doesn't make any sense. But you know, whatever. It's it's yeah, it does. I mean, De Francois did that very famously back in the early two thousands. Yeah, the Pentium Four Extreme Edition was a Xeon, and they repackaged it as a high end desktop chip. Mm-hmm. And I mean, AMD did it honestly with a Threadripper. Yeah, when the when you double your cash, well, probably more than more than that, and also you have to. Uh, compensate from the uh, through silicon vias that they use for the 3d stacking you're, you're going to have to turn that latency up a little bit and so yeah four cycles is not going to kill you especially when you're being able to address that much more cash that because you're going to be making fewer trips out to main memory and that that's 
the four cycles is nothing as compared to that trip. In other AMD oh. news, AMD yeah. has shared Ryzen Pro 6000 series mobile processor details. And there's a whole bunch of slides and a long blog post, and I summarized some of it here. And then investigating the footnotes, which don't make any sense. Anyway, uh, they're talking about this as being leadership performance. The world's most advanced processors for laptop PCs is what their website says. And there's a new lineup. Of course, these are pro processors, so they have a multi-layered set of security features at the hardware OS and system level, according to uh, page 22 of the slide deck. So the family is going to include some 5000 U series still, three SKUs down there. And then there's new Ryzen Pro 6000 U series, which are the thin and light, so 28 watt. And then the Ryzen Pro 6000 H series, which are either 35 or 45 watt configurable. All the 6000 series parts are new six nanometer. So they should have lower power consumption. Clock speeds reach all the way up to 4.9 gigahertz at the top. The flagship part is the Ryzen 9 Pro 6950H. Eight cores, 16 threads still this time around. And these, of course, are Zen 3 Plus architecture with RDNA 2 graphics. The more interesting, though, than even any of those processors is this mysterious Ryzen 7 Pro 6860Z, which is exclusive to a Lenovo ThinkPad Z. And it's deep co-design for the ultimate collaboration laptop, it says. And it sounds like something that was machine translated. They don't give the specifications for the 6860Z, but that's the one they used in this blog post about the performance of these new processors. So... In this blog post, they said that it demonstrated up to 17% faster performance than the competition in the kind of apps you'd use if you're a professional using this for work. So MS Office and Microsoft Teams. And they said up to 45% longer battery life for Teams conferencing compared to the competition. So they were very into video conferencing with this launch. Uh, their stuff does look good with the 6000 series. Uh, they, they seem pretty tightly packaged, uh, seem to have a lot of their design stuff really on on point. Everything we've seen so far uh, in terms of performance, power consumption, battery life, heat production. Uh, they seem like uh, they're, they're, they really are a competitive part to what Intel has. And they're going to have some pricing and per core advantages, it seems like, across the board. So, yeah, nice nice for, for AMD. Can't wait to actually get specifications and more third-party testing. I want to see this new Z laptop, which has this mysterious part in it. Yes. Raja Kadori has been promoted at Intel. He's an executive. Yes, he is. Well, he, he always was an executive, but now he's an executive vice president. So it's a, it's a bump up for him. It's a, it's kind of a good attaboy for, Hey, you've, you've done good in, in leading this. We're, we're going to give you a bigger title and probably some more money and maybe a few more responsibilities, but uh, I don't think it's going to change dramatically what he does for the group. Um, but yeah, it, I mean, internally, they they seem to be very happy with uh, what Raja has done with the graphics. And yes, it was not the greatest launch ever. They made some serious mistakes about availability and performance timing. is not fantastic. And yeah, timing's bad. And and we're not going to see desktop stuff till you know late summer. So we're looking August time frame. If you knew how chaotic the graphics portion of Intel was Mm. to the point that he got in, it's just insane. There was something like 15 different significant architectures in three generations of CPUs and getting drivers for them was awful. And... He went in there and it seems like, you know, he was able to consolidate. He was able to get, you know, a singular kind of focus on on design and what they need to do and integrated these groups and probably got multiple all together and work, you know, are, are pushing, you know, next generation stuff and the generation after that uh, with, with different teams. 
But yeah, uh, from all the stories that I had heard uh, from inside Intel, I mean, the, it was just, it was a hodgepodge of graphics teams and products and a lot of uh, uh, dismay from the software and driver development team because they had to support so many, not radically different, but different enough that you couldn't share a lot of stuff. So, yeah. Um, if he was able to You're clean not up that mess. Uh, my dog wants oh, to I've bring upset up your dogs. Yeah, see? This is just going to be a race now with the next generation AMD and NVIDIA stuff due shortly, you know, towards the end of the year. Yeah. Our hasn't really launched yet. The expectation was that their highest end card was going to be, let's just make it an NVIDIA comparison, you know, that 3070-ish realm. And if they could have come in with a good price, they would have been very extremely competitive. It would have been real, the real savior of the industry. But it just seems like they're just a half step behind where you know, the primary players are, is is it really going to matter? You know, that's really was the question there. Was this an, uh, was this an award too soon? Was it the attaboy too soon? You know, well done, you know, we're going to, we're going to take them on and we're going to deliver. You know, I just wasn't sure that maybe internally, you know, as you say, they were a mess before and he really brought order to chaos, but I just don't know if they're going to have the impact that they hope that they would just because of this timing thing that Jeremy mentioned. So the promotion uh, came along with a, a length of rope is what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it's a, that's an interesting way to put it. Could be. Yeah. Well, we're going to put you up here and I, we hope you do well. Cause otherwise, well, that's awesome. That's you're awesome. You're great. Yeah. But, I mean, you're, you know, in terms of, we you. don't know, we don't know their timeline. I mean, we don't see True. what happens inside and we don't know exactly the progress and developing a new GPU that is at least competitive with the mid range of, the current market leaders is not an easy thing to do. I mean, Via has tried it, S3, BitBoy's Oi, um, 3D Labs, Matrox, all these guys in the past have, have tried to be competitive. And it's just, it's really hard because AMD and NVIDIA have a lot of good things going on. And yeah. I mean, if, if you can at least get, by the end of the summer, a high-end desktop that is, matches a 3070, that's kind of a win. As long as you price it right, that's okay. But we haven't gotten to that point yet, and we'll have to dive deep once we actually see these cards and Ryan Trout better send me one. <clears throat> <laughs> Maybe if you ask really nicely. And you never stay in a hotel room. That was Josh asking nicely. (laughs) And you never stay in a hotel room with him again. (laughs) In some news that will impact both GPUs and CPUs potentially in the future, TSMC's two nanometer node is now due towards the end of 2025. As Jeremy writes, time to move to Angstroms. Intel already has. <laughs> yeah, their their 18A is their their next in uh, fab process. So 18 Angstroms, because you know 0. 0.02 nanometers just isn't going to roll off the tongue eventually if we can get that far. So yeah, technically it would be the two Angstrom uh, <laughs> line from. Uh, TSMC, but uh, it's a little bit of a switch because for the longest time, Intel kind of got stuck uh, doing a waltz around a certain process node and didn't seem to be able to land a good step at that process node, let alone move beyond it. And meanwhile, TSMC and Samsung are happily shrinking the process and shrinking it and shrinking it and shrinking it until now. It's actually looking like Intel may be doing their 18A line before the end of this year. Uh, now, not necessarily be buyable by you and I, but uh, definitely starting to print it out and getting the, the fab process running and stamping out all of the uh, the bugs, hopefully, uh, which means that you know it's going to be a little while before TSMC, who supplies the vast majority of the market right now, at this node anyways, or the, the, the small nodes, isn't going to be doing it until sometime in 2025. And that generally indicates that one, they've either run into tooling problems or they've run into technical problems with the wafers, or they're just making so much money at the current node that they're like, you know what, it's, we're, we're going to work on that, but it's, it's less of an issue than 
just filling up this obscene amount of demand that's been pent up that we can deal with. So it'll be interesting to see if Intel can actually pull this off. It'll be the long, it's been a long time uh, since they've sort of been ahead on the process notes. Josh probably even remembers when that was. Intel is, is talking a big talk with the whole 18A uh, being, you know, kind of available when it is. And yes, TSMC has pushed out two nanometer, which, you know, supposedly comparable, but we've, we've now gone to really extreme marketing uh, names for these things. And I think in the very end, they're still going to be limited by physics and lithography. Uh, EUV stuff is coming out and it is an improvement and you're going to require fewer masks and exposures and stuff like that, but it's still a very new technology. Um, and yeah, just playing the physics of materials and deposition and yields and, and getting bins and, and just all of these things together. It's a lot. And I, I, I mean, it's, you know, it, it'd be nice to be optimistic that Intel is going to have a product that is leaps and bounds and, you know, a generation past what the third party guys and AMD has, but we've really entered a new realm of, of manufacturing that, you know, TSMC is spending a significant amount of money uh, in research and development. And they've got a lot of fabs. They've got a lot of engineers. Samsung is behind them. Global Foundries is is there. They seemingly are running to stand still. They finally made profit with Global Foundries in the last couple of quarters, but they did that by really just cutting their their development of seven nanometer and beyond into very 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 low levels and just focusing on kind of the seventy percent of the market that requires these you know twelve nanometer fourteen nanometer. 20 nanometer, 28 nanometer stuff that, you know, are still very, very viable um, lines. But I'm not entirely convinced that Intel has gotten over all of its issues. 10 nanometer seems to be okay for them. Uh, It has not reached the 14 nanometer kind of plateau for, you know, how expensive per chip it is to, you know, process the entire thing. Uh, it's, It's a lower level. They, they seemingly have gotten, you know, some of the power and yield issues down. But if, you know, if you run a 12900K, I mean, you're still pulling a tremendous amount of, of power in that. And uh, it's not perfect, but I, I don't have the faith yet in Intel delivering just because they've been seriously at least in 2014, back when, and even a little bit before that, 22 nanometer had some issues, uh, but not too bad. They were able to fix them. 14 nanometer had some significant issues for quite a while, and then we got the 14 nanometer plus, 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 and then all of the very, very, very familiar issues with 10 nanometer that essentially went on for about six years. So, yeah, I, I, I'm not sold yet. Um, I mean, TSMC's already got their six nanometer out. They're doing heavy duty production on five nanometer. Next generation stuff from AMD is going to be five nanometer. I'm, I'm assuming. Um, I can't remember what the four thousand series is. It's supposed to be six nanometer from TSMC. I can't keep all my rumors. No, four, I think. No, that's that's no. not quite ready yet. Apple isn't even on four yet. Apple is is the first people to typically utilize TSMC's most cutting edge uh, process node. So yeah, I think a lot of stuff's going to be five and six nanometer. And you know, six nanometer is a optimized, slightly shrunk version of seven, and five is a a new product. So yeah, I don't know. Uh, you know, put your money where your mouth is, see who's actually producing the chips and uh, selling them. And it's going to be fun to watch. You know, I wish Intel the best of luck. If they do it, then kudos to them. That's 
really impressive engineering and development to get a process, a new process, a cutting edge one up and running in that kind of time. So anyway, that's my two cents. Thank you, Josh. And I thought Intel was actually going to be a little bit more open to using other foundries. So it's not just, Mm -hmm. can they get this process working? It's, well, who will they partner with if they can't? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, their, uh, their graphics cards are, I guess they are either six or seven nanometer from TSMC. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. It's a twofer. Twofer. Data. Now, who ever heard of this? This is kind of interesting. It's an M.2 so I, drive yes. packaged with a SATA drive. Yeah. With yeah. one delightful package for 125 bucks. What's the capacities on these things? It complies with Ryan's law. There's an NVMe for a, that is one terabyte and a 256 gig SATA SSD. So 10 cents a gig. 256 though. I mean, I'm glad it's only 25 yeah. bucks because that's all I'd really ever want to pay for a 256. Because well, yeah. you're not really but think of it as boot that drive, useful. app drive, a boot, boot drive, drive. drive. Why would I want a right. SATA or, drive as my boot drive? Because, because you don't have an NVMe to drive. But you don't have an NVMe, NVMe slot. NVMe. You don't, don't have a slot for it. Oh, I see what you're saying. Like, this isn't just for one system. It could be for like a really old system. Well, it's yes. literally for anyone, as I said when I was posting it, for any of your relatives, friends that inflict spinning rust on you. Hey, can you look at my computer? It's like, why is this taking two minutes? Oh, right. Things used to take minutes to boot up, didn't they? Right. I'm going to kill you now. <laughs> I, you buy yourself a one terabyte SSD and you throw this 256 gig SSD at them and you're like, I'm moving your OS to this on the laptop. You can use the other one for storage. It's fine. I don't have to deal with that. All I have to deal with is your freaking OS drive, and I'm never going to deal with hard drives again unless it's a server and I need high reliability, but no, that's a different story whatsoever. So, yeah, it, it sounds dumb to begin with. Like, why would you pair these two together? But then all of a sudden, when you think of it as you've got someone who's with an old uh, motherboard that does have a PCI 3.0 and VME slot on it that they didn't even know was there, and they're still running some old Western Digital Red because it was cheap one day. So you can get them for very little to pop that in and also have a backup drive, which is an SSD. Neither of them are fast. Uh, they're not going to be, they're not even top of the line PCI 3.0. But then again, for that price, you can't really expect that. But for just forcing somebody to upgrade, so you never have to deal with their damn hard drive again, this actually does make a lot of sense. Yeah, and it, that uh, NVMe, I believe, has no cache. I'm sorry, uh, Jeremy, cache. Just, yeah, it I, does. Uh, it's, it can do oh, SLC. It zero. It's Dramless. I thought it had none. Right. But Dram- it, yeah. it doesn't have any DRAM. Yeah, no, but they all have fake cache. cache. Yeah. I mean, they all have all fake nah, uh, you're SLC. right. And then write. Yeah, fake. Okay. Uh, Read. Moving on. Yeah, moving, moving on. on. Uh, WCCF Tech is reporting that NVIDIA is allegedly beginning testing of its fastest next-gen GPU, the AD102 for the RTX 4090, presumably, featuring 24 gigabit per second GDDR6X memory. Now, we could have guessed this just from Samsung's R6. announcement of 24 mm-hmm. gigabit GDDR6X. So that makes sense that you'd use the fastest memory in your flagship card. And it's one of those data miners, Copite 7 Kimi is talking about the 40 series naming scheme apparently being yeah it might be 50 something well maybe it's gonna be who knows yeah it's, uh, they've skipped numbers before so yeah mm-hmm. yeah so now the There's nvidia cards will here. sound like uh amd cards from two three years ago isn't that funny there's uh if you scroll down i think there's a comparison chart uh uh doing the matchup of yeah here we go why is the chip glowing <clears throat> Yeah. Scroll up a so, bit there. Is it really that hot? Would you have to look? People are going to get like, sick. Seriously. <laughs> I'd be worried. Because they don't actually have the image. So they're just like, hey, this is a clever way of not being able to show a GPU die yeah, for an unannounced just, product. Mm, blow it out. We've talked about these uh, rumored specs before. So, yeah. I mean, it's it's going to be really fast if these are correct. 18,432 CUDA cores. Jeez. I'm sorry. Uh, what am I looking and at? And the rumored top end total board power of their AD102 is 600 watts. Let's Isn't just there? say that Nothing. one kilowatt is not always enough when you're talking about next gen GPUs. <laughs> so, Cooler Master has yes. you covered the M2, uh, M2000. That's 
Cooler Master's M2000 Platinum. Well, you want kilowatt, power efficiency at that point. Is not enough. What, what kind of power <laughs> efficiency does this have? Do you, do you have to have a, a 220 uh, yes. install? Uh, 240 or 260. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Really? Yes. Look, you're not going to get two kilowatts any other way. This is the United States. This, yeah. this is dryer. Yeah, I mean, physics. Yeah, yeah, this is a dryer plug. I mean, the damn thing will produce 166 amp on the single 12 volt. So, yeah. <laughs> Are you saying I have you, to game next to the washing machine? Like, sorry, honey, you uh, can't correct, dry the sir. clothes. I'm still playing. So, and, and I will become big again. Wouldn't recommend uh, an extension cord on that one. That might not be a good thing. idea. Yeah. I need a dryer, yeah, dryer plug in a special room. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, up until now, it was only Superflower that had done this. About this time last year, they came out with a two kilowatt uh, PSU. So, yeah, of course, someone else had to. It's it's It frustrates me in one small little way. It doesn't have the 12.4 PCIe plug-in for the new NVIDIA cards. Oh, really? If you're going to oh, release really? a two kilowatt PSU, why would you not include those natively? Yes, you can buy an adapter for it, but it's unless you're welding with this thing, you're obviously powering something like the, the 3090 Ti or 3080 Ti. You need that plug. How do you think power supply companies feel about that new standard dropping when they were already delayed significantly because of chip shortages and so forth. And now all these products oh, that were developed it. two years ago are coming mm-hmm. out and it's, Oh, there's a new they're standard. They're obsolete. We're not complaining. They're almost they're obsolete already. Yeah. No, I'm I mean, sure they're, they're, they're happy probably that. happy that they can happy. sell a whole bunch more power supplies. Yeah. Oh, because the requirements constantly are going up and up and up, even though chip yeah. efficiency is being better. Well, that's so that the uh, GPU can get more power. <laughs> Kent has uh, tried his hand at writing a news post, and this is a story about Rocket Cool. You may know them. They make delidding tools, and they have a 12th gen delid relid kit. Apparently, this came out around a month ago, but now the reviews have kind of started trickling in. And Kent has been keeping tabs on this, and he said that the reviews are actually pretty good on this thing. And look at this chart here. Stock versus relid, it's significant. The temperatures on this chart, if you're listening to the audio version, go from about 85C, this is at 5.1 gigahertz, to somewhere around 75. That's about 10 degrees cooler. And he said, in case you're wondering, yes, this mod will absolutely void your warranty, and Ryan Trout might just come directly to your house and slap you, although we have not received full confirmation from Intel about the latter point. Mm Mm-hmm. It's fifty nine ninety nine for this kit. The slap kit. costs extra. Well, yeah. Put it in the order notes. Have Ryan slap me in the oh misspell in the face. Thanks. This is the eighth and ninth generation version. Okay. And I've delitted about six or seven CPUs with this. And it's the and sound some of them that it makes. Lives. The sound that it makes when this when the IHS cracks off in one of these is downright disturbing. Uh, but it works the treat about uh, cracking them. And then this is an alignment tool. This piece right here is an alignment tool for actually getting the IHS set properly back. I'm pretty sure I've killed that on Space Invaders. Okay, this is not a Space Invaders enemy. This is a this is an alignment tool. It actually fits. Uh, I'll use the wrong one, but it fits perfectly over this piece so you can drop it. Actually, it's in this side, but the point is made. So you can drop it over the top and get it a perfectly uh, put back on the substrate. Josh, did you still anyway, have something to Nice tool. You, you would think that with Intel's manufacturing prowess that they would be able to do something better and get that 10 degrees than some guy in his garage cracking off the IHS and putting in something themselves and reattaching it. I mean, yes, uh, I would think so. But you would in the past, so. they've proved that And maybe it certainly wouldn't be an extra $60 to do it per chip. I don't no. think I paid that much for the previous 8th, ninth gen oh, version. Okay. 
Inflation. It's real. Okay. Yeah, Hackaday apparently. has an article about the Commodore 64, the most popular home computer of all time. It's 40 years old. How old do you feel if you had one of these as a kid? Yikes. Knowing that it's 40 years old. I mean, still older than the yeah. Commodore 64. Yeah, well, it's true. This one looks like it needs uh, refurbished, but a yes. little it needs a little uh, rebright or what do they call that? Um, retro bright, retro bright. We don't yes. we don't have retro do we need bright. to have a discussion about retro Shiny bright here? Bright. You no. know, actually, that would be sort of fun. A retro bright. No, we, we're running long. I, anyway. I put a picture. I put a picture back here paying homage to the yeah, C64 I saw it. That I, I saw actually it. actually had a C- I had this C sixty four and I had this fifteen forty one disk drive five and a quarter inch floppies. I know I actually had it. Serial, serial external five and a quarter inch floppy drive. Single side. Got a mere weighing it into mere twenty some pounds. Essentially, it was another computer yeah. wrapped around a floppy drive and, and a serial port that went between the the systems. It was so much faster than cassette. I thought it, it was the best thing ever. <laughs> Let's pause here for a word from our podcast sponsor this week. Hey, as a small business owner, you're juggling a hundred balls in the air and you don't have time to interview candidates who just aren't qualified for your role. LinkedIn Jobs makes that easier for you to find the people you want to interview faster and for free. I know that LinkedIn Jobs has worked for me in the past and connected me with qualified people and hiring organizations, and it can help you too. Create a free job post in minutes on LinkedIn Jobs to reach your network and beyond to the world's largest professional network of over 770 million people. Then add to your job and the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you're hiring so that your network can help you find the right people to hire. Simple tools like screening questions make it easier to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and then hire. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the candidates you want to talk to faster. Did you know that every week, nearly 40 million job seekers visit LinkedIn? Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash pcper. That's linkedin.com slash pcper to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. We're back and we're going to crank up this play day. I'm feeling a little bit cranky just looking at this hipster contraption. Who can tell me about play date, which is apparently now in people's hands, finally? I didn't understand I this. I don't, under- I don't understand. Jeremy explained this to me. <laughs> so the crank is a controller. Okay. Is that how you charge it? See, now that was the assumption and it made a lot of sense, but no, it's, it's, it's mostly a controller. So this is for playing it's fishing good. games. I uh, I don't actually know. It launched with 24 games. I do not know if one of them was a fishing game because I didn't pre-order it. But, uh, I mean, you will be amused. Uh, the screen itself is a memory display with really, really high contrast. They put it next to, like, a Game Boy, and it's it's ridiculous. You can see it in bright sunlight, like, say, the picture that was being taken right there. Mm-hmm. So yeah. you don't have to buy the extra little light for it. And the screen is about the same size as a Game Boy. Uh, so it, it gives you sort of an idea. Uh, I don't get it. Like, it's 180 bucks for some silly little <laughs> games. Uh, but it's it, like a lot of people were really, really excited about it. And the whole, you know, Game Boy D-pad and A and B button. But then I started reading and I'm like, okay, you know, I, I've this is really popular, so I should probably mention it. And it is odd. So at least I want to know. And then... Oh, no, there was an SDK released with it. So there are people like busily trying to mod Doom over to this thing. And apparently the the creators of of Playdate don't care. They're like, no, we gave you the SDK kit because we want to see what the hell you can do. And so, I mean, it might become interesting. But at the same time, I just, I don't do the mobile gaming much. The the sort of handheld or the phone or anything. Don't know if I'd describe what this does as mobile gaming, so you don't have to. Well, you definitely are mobile with it. I will leave you with this image. Uh, this is the kind of fiddly, weird nonsense that some people <laughs> find amusing. It's like, I'm holding this tiny device with this even tinier hey, little uh, imagine how easy crank Flappy on the Birds side with would my be. fingertip. And look, Flappy it's, it's glorious so black easy. and white. And who, who needs that color crap anyway? But then again, if I'm using a Game Boy, I'm probably playing classic Game Boy games like, you know, Tetris and Pokemon, not a uh, stick guy runs across screen while I crank furiously. 
Uh, hot, hot YouTube take. That's like a hacker. You can't crank got furiously me. in public, or else you'll get. An, I don't, I wouldn't be able to crank furiously with this thing because I, my hands would both be oh. busy operating the damn thing. That, so. And that was mentioned is that in there's a few of the games where you have to crank madly, and they didn't like it because they had to essentially put it down on something so you could do that. Some of them, it's more of a gentle cranking motion. You know, you you can't just yank it all the time. Oh, Occasionally, you have to move yeah. it slowly and rotate it nicely. Yeah, uh, yeah. Chip, somebody says, odd. "I don't somebody, get it." But somebody I in the mention. chat, the YouTube chat, says, "Dreamcast memory card." Lol. Yeah, it's like one of those VMUs. And, oh no, there is the no memory thing. card slot. There, there, there is no just, removable memory on this at all. Oh, of course not. The all you need to know the height of the pretentious nature of this device. It has a little text bubble that pops up it's 25 minutes past noon on wednesday july 21st like the, the way it spells out i don't know i just uh, i find it's, this I can't even tell you the time it can't even tell you the time it's cringy little hipster thing really yeah yes yeah, just <laughs> PBR it's a kitschy with it. hipster thing here it is next to a nintendo switch it's 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 we I like those handheld systems where you can, you know, put a mini or a micro SD card in them and load ROMs and play whatever you want on them. Homebrew games or games from Nintendo and other companies. Your iOS app may be covertly tracking you despite what Apple says. Now, I but believe this to be true because the tracking transparency has been circumvented by clever people. And even though I say do not, uh, do not track... I think it's still happening. I think Facebook found a way. Look, app tracking transparency is a viable thing. Sure. But until it's it, circumvented. There are, ways, there are ways to get around it, especially for the big players. Like Using Alibaba? Side. No, yes. Okay. Yes, yes, Alibaba. Yes. Yeah, that's actually one of them. But they're using server side. They're hooking into the APIs. They're, yeah. you know, if you say accept... You know, kind of throws all the rules out the window. It's it's better to have ATT than not have it. But yes, this is still going on. Wait, ATT like uh, American no. Telegraph and Telephone? No, 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 no. It's the uh, it's the um, the tracking anti tracking. Oh, okay. So last week's research paper says this article at some website. I think it's ours or something from the font says that while ATT in many ways works as intended, loopholes in the framework also provided the opportunity for companies, particularly large ones like Google and Facebook, to work around the protections and stockpile even more data. And ATT may give users a false sense of security. Of course it does. What happens on your iPhone stays on your iPhone until we start, you know, scanning your photos. We do have a story from the register, as always, uh, about ESET. I like their snark. ESET. They uncovered vulnerabilities in Lenovo laptops. Oh, no. Say it ain't so. Firmware updates incoming. Please tell us more. Yeah, how'd that go, Brett? I just did them. I And it was, it took like an hour and a half to patch the uh, Intel manager and the BIOS. And there was an NVMe driver. And I feel so much safer now. I'm, I'm sure there's no other bugs. I'm sure it's fine. There'll never be it's never there'll never be a problem again. I feel safe. It's all good. You should feel safe. Huh. Yep. So this bug, uh, actually you have to have admin access uh, and it intercepted one of the low level boot uh, code uh, or one of the low level boot steps in the secure portion of the UF, UEFI boot. Uh, and it could hijack SFI, which is the, the secure section of the boot or EFI bootloader and things of that nature. So yeah, anti-security once again. And it basically allowed uh, bad actors to entirely own the machine. What a surprise. Right. But you had to have access to it. While we're on the subject of security, let's talk about Log4j again. Because apparently AWS's Log4j patches blew holes in its own security. Yep. Cell phone on this one. Jeremy, you know about yeah. this one? So, not so, very much, apart from the fact that uh, I, I now want to start learning how to do system out print lane. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> at this that point, was, it's like just screw it. <laughs> that was that was a joke graphic that sort of accompanied this. You got to go find that one. But anyway, this one was sort of embarrassing. The it, but you got to hand it to them; they tried to fix things as fast as they could. So what they did is they tried to identify the processes running as Java. 
and they patched things uh, as it was running. So it was a runtime patch in order to uh, subvert the calls to the problematic logging function that would have caused a remote code in gestation and then you know obviously remote code execution but what they didn't do is make sure that the executable that they were patching was actually java because they looked for it by name so if you had an executable i believe this is what it was if you had an executable that would that would fake the the process name of java you could have it elevated it could because that was part of the the aws patch was to elevate the the process to root level and uh, then change it. Well, that would, could elevate your process named conveniently Java to have uh, super root or, and root permissions and then do anything you wanted with your code just because you named it appropriately. Sweet. Yeah. Java is your friend. Uh, they sent to put out patches. Please, everybody, if you have an instance, please do a uh, yum uh, update. Everybody. Yeah. Yum. Especially EC- if you're on Amazon. EC2 users, please, please yum, yum update. Yeah. Let's move on to the review portion of this week's show. And we actually do have... I didn't do a review this week. What are you talking about? I know. Jeremy, please, just take the week off. It's fine. You don't have to do a review. Okay. I will. The so-called editor-in-chief of the site should post a review once in a while. And I posted a review of this tiny little beast right here, which has been sitting next to me the entire show. And yes, inside of this is one of those ultra rare, sold out everywhere Ryzen 7 5800X 3D processors. I have, to do, I have to do more analysis of this. I did a ton of testing on this, but I didn't really put much of that into the review because I'm trying to review a system, a complete system, not just the processor. But I've got all this data and I'm running new benchmarks on the 12900K and KS. I don't have an uh, i7 of the 12th gen. And I'm tired of buying hardware this month. Did you take the 5800X 3D out of the chassis and pop it into one of your boards for a... No, I have not yet. I've not done that. Okay. You wouldn't admit that anyway, would you? (laughs) All right. So we looked at the Falcon Northwest Tiki. This is the 2022 version of the Tiki, and I will talk about why that matters here in a minute. But of course, our sample featured AMD's new greatest gaming processor of all time, the Ryzen 7 5800X 3D. And this system, if you're not familiar with the Tiki, it's about the size, I would say, for the DIY enthusiasts in the audience, if you have ever held in your hand one of those giant motherboard boxes that the high-end Asus ROG motherboards come in, they're like four Mm. inches thick, like 12 or 13 inches square, that is what, that's the exact size of this system. It's four inches wide. And it is 13 by 13 inches, roughly. I mean, the dimensions are a little bit bigger than that when you factor in the base. There's this very heavy, solid aluminum base on it to keep it stable on your desktop. And then, you know, there's like protrusions and, you know, the front make it like, I don't know, it's closer to 14 inches deep, I guess. But anyhow, this thing is small. It's very small. And there's no compromises on components, especially with the new design. And we will talk about that because, and here's a picture of it, so you can see it in some better lighting. Nice. It's hard It's hard to gauge scale with this when you take pictures of it because of the, the fact that it's a tower. Oh, it's, it looks like a full tower from back in the day. But it's, it's like a tiny version of a full tower. Anyway, um, here's the inside. So you get an idea of how everything fits in there. And this is similar to, uh, I think it was called the Sentry 2.0. It was a console-sized case is what they called it. So the internal layout is similar to that, except this one is big enough that it can fit a full-length GPU along with a 120-millimeter closed-loop liquid cooler. And there's enough clearance for everything to fit and for there to be adequate airflow because of how ventilated the case is. So this has that kind of a tiered how, design. How big is that power supply? It's an SFXL. And they went all out with this build. I mean, this was meant to showcase not only AMD's new processor, but what you can do with the Tiki. And so it's a RTX 3080 Ti. You can configure one of these with a 3090 if you wish. 
but the power supply is that ridiculously dense uh, unit from Silverstone. It's a 1,000 watt SFXL power supply. Wolf. And uh, is yeah. that an SSD uh, holder? Yes. In this right picture, in which is the sort of the stock picture that I used to illustrate huh. this, you can put either a hard drive or up to two SSDs side by side oh, on nice. this uh, front bracket. Ah. But no optical drive, eh? No optical drive. There used to be an optical drive slot yeah. in the top of the Tiki, but that is gone because it's all about airflow. Here are a couple of still images from this. I wanted to use the the GIF, but it was a 10 megabyte file. I'm like, I don't want to recompress this and make it look terrible. So here are a couple of relevant stills. You can see how the airflow with the Axial uh, style GPUs works because there's t a lot of um, airflow that can escape the top. It's basically all uh, ventilated up there. And then it's also designed for that pass-through style cooling that you need for the Founders Edition NVIDIA cards. So it works with both, and it works great. I'll get into the thermals later. I have a little chart. But it's a new for 2022 design that's all about airflow. There is perforations. There's ventilation all over. If you look at the left side, you'll see the giant intakes for your GPU. There's a big intake for the SFX L power supply and another intake uh, behind the motherboard tray. Apparently it comes in the back, moves all around and there's perf there's um, more of these <laughs> vents on the other side. This is specifically there because of those NVIDIA cards because you need the air to pass through. They should so sell magnetic uh, air filters that you can just attach to the side of that. Like just a, yeah, a slap on it. filter that covers the side of it. Yeah, I forgot to talk about that because there there are no. I mean, there's kind of if you look at it, it's not just wide open because you have like this mesh in here, but you would need to periodically vacuum this off. But the the other ones didn't look filtered. They had like there's nothing there. No. Just, well, some yeah. people hate it, but just like an add on to pop, magnetically snaps on and. Be yeah, brilliant. magnetic uh, magnetic filter would be nice. There is. space is at such a premium inside of this thing because it's so small that. I wonder if there would even be a... Because if you wanted the filter to be convenient and have a frame around it and be easy to take out, you'd be and taking out the, the motherboard gauze... to get the filter out of there. It would be a mess. Even gauze, even gauze frames need like a, a plastic a support or else yeah. they just sort of deteriorate. Here's a look at the back. And as you can see, the back also pretty much just open. So think of this as, you know, it's it's about as wide open as you can get for something in this form factor. And... Because it's so well ventilated, it performs almost as if it was an open test bed. Because there's nothing really impairing the airflow of any of the components inside. But uh, here's our test system uh, with the door open. And you can see that there's a 120 millimeter Asetek, uh unit down there to cool the 5800X3D, which, by the way, was very well behaved thermally throughout all testing with this thing. So. I'm impressed. I've got a 5800X uh, on a 360, and it still gets fairly hot under load. Well, see, that's the magic of the 5800X 3D, because it is limited in a way that the 5800X is not. So it is better ah. behaved thermally than the 5800X is. Because this one's not going point. up to 1.45 volts. It's limited to 1.35 mm. or less. Interesting. So even mm. though there's that you know huge L3 cache layer, it's still, at least in my experience so far, better behaved. So uh, the specs of this system, and I'll get into just a list here. It's a uh, Asus ROG Strix B550i gaming motherboard and 64 gigabytes of Kingston Fury Renegade RGB DDR4 3600CL18 memory. So it's dual rank, big 32 gigabyte modules. The SSD is ridiculous. It is a four terabyte Seagate Fire CUDA 530 Drive and I'll just follow this link here for a moment to show you that this drive is a thousand dollars. So it is very fast. The four terabyte model is not rated for the 7300 megabytes per second, by the way. It's only 7250, which wow, this easily so hit. Slower. Yeah, so you sacrifice the uh 50 megabytes per second because of mm. the massive capacity. Mm. So in addition to that ridiculous SSD, it's got the RTX 3080 Ti Founders Edition card you saw in those pictures, the Silverstone SX1000 LPT SFXL power supply with 1,000 watts of 80-plus platinum 
power. And then, of course, the uh, Ryzen 7 5800X3D, which is cooled by an Asetek 550LC, which has been around for a while. This is uh, not a new design, but it works quite well in this instance. 120 millimeters. It was paired with a Silverstone Air Slimmer 120 fan for, you know, the limited clearance we have in there. We And it works quite well. And it was not loud. Wow, interesting. Could somebody assemble that particular Asetek uh, AIO um, using uh, who's? I mean, who could we get the 120 that's going to fit up to that? I guess. Uh, yeah, the, the yeah the actual CLC is pretty standard. Yeah. I think a lot of designs are based on something very similar to this. It's just pairing it with a slim fan and the way these cables run. Yeah. You need the 90 degree angle. Um, connectors down at the pump yeah. i think it's just similar to the one that mm. they sell to dell that dell had been integrating okay. into the alienware system mm. for a long time but they have a custom um hose length this one the hose is long enough that you can actually open the door all the way without removing mm -hmm. it but anyhow uh just nice little touches i pointed out things like the fact that there is this metal bracket holding the gpu in place so it's held in place on both sides so it cannot move at all even during shipping which is important because this uses one of those by 16 Gen 4 uh, riser ribbon cable assemblies for the GPU, which is above the motherboard. So you kind of don't want that moving around. I pointed out that they have a cable, of course, on the SFX L power supply routing the actual power input to the back, but that assembly protrudes from the rear of the case because there just isn't sufficient room inside above the corner of the motherboard to put it in here without it obstructing something so just this is, just gives you an idea of how little space we're talking here like the entirety of this is four inch deep 13 inch square like it's, it's not a pizza box but i mean i guess maybe like a breadstick box <laughs> well, and it's... well how did it all perform when you heated it up well, as you can yeah. see from our configuration uh, here with the Hardware Info 64 summary, the system running the latest BIOS version, which is version 2603, as I write this anyway, uh, I ran a bunch of testing. Uh, not all of it is going to be visible in this review. I'll have more of it soon to share, but just to give you an idea. I mean, I got to the point with this where I'm like, I, I'm just validating the fact that, yes, uh, a Founders Edition 3080 Ti performs like a Founders Edition 3080 Ti. And the new Ryzen 5800X3D performs as I expected it to, based on all the benchmarks and other results that are out there. So instead of looking at benchmarks validating performance, but I will show you the uh, FireCuda 530 drive performance, by the way. Now, I wasn't getting quite the maximum theoretical write speeds of up to 6,900 megabytes per second. But I was getting 6,800, and I was getting slightly over the rated read speeds. So, uh, very fast SSD. It's for, it's forgivable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, thermals are what I was interested in, because that's usually the trade-off with big components inside of a tiny space. And here, I uh, started a, a gaming workload test, and then I forgot about it. And then I went and turned it off after about 95 minutes. And during that time of running 1080p extreme uh, Unigen Heaven, the GPU temperature settled at about 70 degrees. The hot spot was about 75, 76. And the CPU, as you can see, kind of the CPU uh, usage varies with the benchmark itself, the different scenes. But it never even hit 70. So this thing... It's a nice pattern, too. This thing... Very, very well behaved thermally in all of my testing. I could get the CPU up higher if you're just running Blender workloads uh, with you know 120 millimeter all-in-one liquid cooler. I could get, I think the die, yeah, the max T die reading was 85. Highest recorded temp was 83.1. That's during just you know consistent seven, eight minute long runs of 100% on all cores, and that's normal for these chips anyway. So, yeah, it's because of all that ventilation, it, it performs as if there's no enclosure around the components because their fans are right even, up against, you know, the outside air. 
you couldn't even get that 120 AIO saturated. I'm, I'm just impressed. Not, by not that. really. I, I'm sure I could with an Intel part, and they don't actually yes. offer Intel's uh, fastest CPUs. Um, yeah, system. strangely, they chose not to. That's eh? odd. Mm. <laughs> you can see the component uh, wireframe layout to show where everything is, and there's you can stack the two SSDs. Actually, that's how it works. Or put one hard drive in there. So there is some there's some storage options available. You can see the the location of the uh, fans if you were to install a pair of 120 millimeter fans up there. You know, I guess if you weren't using a discrete GPU, if you wanted to do that. But uh, here I, I am showing a floppy disk for scale, of course. So Does it is slightly of- wider than a Gravis Ultrasound version 3.11 installed disk one of six. Uh, do people understand like what a floppy is anymore? Do they have a concept of how it's a like, save it's icon? A, yeah, it's the save <laughs> icon. You're right. <laughs> the save icon. Yeah. I, I think we're to the point where a younger person would have no idea. <laughs> I actually showed my son an audio cassette the other day. And I was like, hey, <laughs> buddy, look, you know what this is? He's like, a graphics card? I'm like, no, it's not another graphics card. <laughs> I said, it's a, it's now, a tape. Are- like, well, no, you know what tape is. It's not like scotch tape. It's like it's, it has tape in it. And then I showed him like, and there's little particles uh, that are on here that that get like uh, the, the the magnetically hold the the waveform signal and you can play it back. And he's just like, he left the room. So, yeah. But it still has two fans in the middle. Uh, what's the price on this thing? Price on the one that we had in for review. As tested. Let me see. As tested. Is is up there be, partly because of that SSD. We're talking five thousand three hundred fifty-seven dollars. This is not for the faint of wow. heart or the faint of wallet. This is a, wow. this is not, not a, a budget system. But not you take away off. now. There is a configuration right below this where you take that four terabyte Seagate drive down That's to a two one. terabyte yeah. Samsung drive, and you save like seven hundred ninety-five dollars. Seven hundred. So, yeah. Yeah, I would do that if it were me configuring mm-hmm. this. And you can you can configure these systems anywhere from like three thousand dollars and up, but they don't base configurations for these are on the like the high end side anyway. So mm. well, it's like the, the northwest. Yeah, yeah the, the the lowest end yeah. GPU you can get in one of these systems is an RTX thirty sixty Ti. So and, and with component prices and and such, I'm sure that factors into it to a certain degree, but the what I've noticed about these is that at the outset, if you look at it, you're like, well, that's like a thousand dollars more than DIY. And then uh, the higher up you go, the lower the prices get to the point where you're basically at DIY for the components. And then the extra that you're paying covers the three year warranty, the lifetime tech support, the like return shipping is free for the first year for repairs. All that kind of stuff is wrapped in. And most companies, like if you were to order an alienware system from Dell, you've got to pay like a couple hundred extra dollars to, get the two or three year warranty upgrade off of the initial one year warranty. So, and plus you got to, you know, pay the employees to build these things for you and pay for the guy to do the support. Yeah. Well, they do really good warranty support at Falcon Northwest unless that's changed. Also, no, they're famous. Clearly that's a custom case for them with their, you know, Oh, and they go all out. Kel mentioned the base. I didn't realize the base because I talked about how heavy it was. And he's like, oh, yeah, the base is solid aluminum. They actually have this milled for them out of a block. Wow. Like, you know, it didn't have to be aluminum. I didn't even know it was aluminum, but it's aluminum. So it this just some of the choices that have been made in here are made because of wanting to make this have, like, a superior fit and finish and a particular look and the way that the cables are routed and everything else with these systems is like a, a step above what most people are even going to be able to do themselves. So you just have to factor all that in. It's time for picks. Okay. It is Josh, still time. Take it away. Week. Me. Uh, I, 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 I've been keeping track of these for the past five days. And in the last three days, the cards have gone down. Well, five days, they've gone from 900 to 650 to 599. And now this as rock, RX 6700 XT is now only $50 more over MSRP for the card. That's uh, finally at the point where, you know what? 
it probably is worth it to get one because here's the big deal. Yes, we have the 6750s coming out, I believe. Um, but China's been locked down for the past couple of weeks and everything is going to come crawling to a stop in terms of what's in the channel in probably around six weeks. So you got to weigh with yourself. Should I buy it now with the chance of it, you know, going a little lower, at least, you know, heading towards MSRP, maybe at $500 max, or do I run the risk of suddenly there's just no more supply anymore because of all the crazy things going on in this world? I mean, if you look at the shipping outside of Shanghai uh, in the harbor, it's insane. There are so many boats waiting to be unloaded and loaded up. It's, it's not funny. So if I were really looking for a, well, a new mid-range card in the $500 level, this this would probably be one of my first choices because performance is good. Thermals are okay. It does run at high clock speed, which is kind of interesting in, in certain aspects of how it does the, uh, the cash on board. Um, so yeah, this would be my pick. And ASRock makes a reasonable board. There you go. Huzzah. Only $50 over MSRP. It's like only a, like a 10-ish percent premium. Impressive. Yeah. 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 It's, it's a lovely thing. May the next deal actually bring it down to MSRP. Well, I Josh's guess. point here is the window of opportunity to potentially buy at only a slightly insulting price. It, it could potentially be limited due to uh, lack of supply coming out of China. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we think the bubble bursts, but then there could be another 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 artificial squeeze i'm right. sorry it's not yeah it's not artificial when the stuff is i did that too high. Let, me, yeah. let me get underneath there yeah, squeeze <laughs> all right jeremy your okay. pick this week i didn't do that uh well how about a reasonable psu for a reasonable price because we don't all need two kilowatt buddy power supplies so 650 watt will run a lot of things and so this is a Canadian deal, but uh, and it's not the newest from Corsair, but their CXM uh, systems or PSUs have been really good in the past. And so a 650 watt, uh, partially modular, which is nice because are you ever going to build a system where you don't need your ATX power connector? Like it's 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 a thing. It's going to be needed. And as we've gone over exhaustively over the past years, adding a connector adds resistance, it will lessen your power delivery. So how about, you know, a 650 watt PSU for half price? 60 bucks is not bad at all for this thing. Or, I mean, if you wanted to do the open box, you can get it for 53. But uh, yeah, it's, it's not the sexiest of components, but if you've got a bad power supply, you, your life's going to be a nightmare until you figure it out. And those are Canadian dollars, so... Here, stateside. Yeah, I don't know what it is down in the States. but It's even less. Significantly less. That's Kanuki Stan Copex. Brett, your pick this week. My pick this week is the Corsair K K70 TKL, which is my personal choice of gaming keyboard. I really enjoy the linear switches in this one, and it is a very, very high-speed, low-latency keyboard and incorporates Corsair's Axum, uh, real-time operating system, uh, fully RGB programmable if you kind of swing that way. Um, it's a great keyboard, and this is roughly $30 to $50 off, depending on where you set your, your pricing metric. So at $109 for a keyboard, still maybe a little bit expensive, but this is the smaller 10 keyless, nicely programmable, and like I said, very, very fast. And I like the uh, linear red switches, personally, so... This would be my pick. Excellent. Two Corsair items in tonight's tonight's rollout. My pick is not from Corsair. I ran away earlier during Josh's pick to go find this. <laughs> I think I grabbed the right thing. Yes. It's an MSI motherboard. Let me change cameras here so you can actually see this full screen. 
It's a MicroStar International RX 480. And no, not a graphics card. Back when the RX 480 Neo 2 was a motherboard, as you can see here, hmm. kind of a red motherboard. Is this red? <gasps> it is red and a brilliant red at that. Oh, look at that fan standing up there, all proud and look, stuff. Is, is that an AGP slot? No, this sure. is an early no. PCI Express motherboard. It has a by one and a Ooh. by sixteen. Yep. Interesting. So this is an ATI RX four eighty plus SB four hundred chipset based motherboard. Who knew that ATI? I mean, obviously, people who you know were building computers back in the era. But it's just interesting to look back and see, like during the Enforce era. Here's this ATI option. The RX 480 was a chipset before it was yes, ever it a was. graphics card. No, you should. Uh, Do you know how bad missed... the SB400 chipset was? It was so bad. Was that the one that Good corrupted horrible. data on drives? Yes, and USB was terrible, and the drivers were a pain in the ass. And, and, was and so it's just like <laughs> X570, is that what you're saying? Yeah, so oh. they fixed it somewhat yeah. with the SB600, <laughs> but a lot of the motherboard guys just went and got a VIA chipset. Mm. South yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, they're awful. They were terrible. no, that was back in the four and one days. Oh, yeah. Uh, although it was a it was a sexy red, I will give it that. It, Nothing yeah, else. It was, fire one, but it was a sexy, sexy red. Light. Josh, do you want to take us out as only you can? We would like to thank you for joining us for this very, very fine evening of information and a lot of edit cuts that you will never see unless you watch the live version. You may enjoy those. You might not. You may never watch us again. But until that time, join us next week.